how's it going? Nice to see ya. First up, I want to say I love these new Joy-Con colors, the purple and orange. I didn't think about it until now, but they're perfect for the full season. But that's completely irrelevant, so let me just get started with a shimmy sham. I don't know why. What are we doing today? Oh, we're just doing another 10 eShop games worth buying. If you're new around here, well, you know what to do. I wasn't talking about making a sandwich. What? But if you're not new around here, you know that I've made 17 of these videos, or at least you'll know that I've made a lot of these videos. This is number 18, bringing the tally of eShop games I have reviewed to 180. But regardless, there is 10 more. It's that time of year where games are releasing non-stop, so I just thought I'd make your job a little bit easier and find the good ones for you so that you don't have to. Yeah, welcome. Actually, before I get started, in the last few videos, I've been wearing these really awesome Zelda shirts. And I haven't actually talked about it yet, but everyone keeps asking me where I got them from. And it's from... This is actually my favorite one. It's got that retro trim. It's a little tight. I got the wrong size, but that's on me. <laughs> I actually found this store called Zavi that sell just a ton of things, but they have this Zelda collection. And they actually ended up reaching out to me and asked if they could sponsor a video. So I said, yeah, I'm already wearing the shirts. <laughs> yeah, all you gotta do is go to Zavi's website, click on the little drop down tab, go to gaming. You can find Nintendo, Sonic the Hedgehog, Super Mario, Crash Bandicoot, Zelda. And there is so much more stuff you can get from their Zelda section too, like Christmas sweaters, which, you know, perfect Christmas gift. But yeah, you wanted to know where I got the fabric with the Zelda prints that I drape all over my body in these videos so that I'm not standing here shirtless? The first game on this list today is Sayonara Wild Hearts, and this switch is not on. Oh, and also, I have this weird, like, pimply- I have always had a soft spot for rhythm-based video games. Back since 2008, when I discovered Audio Surf. It was a wonderful gem of a PC game that allowed you to load in your own songs, and it builds a racetrack around the song. That build-up in Darude Sandstorm before that incredible freefall was just about one of the best feelings you can have. You know, other than finding a fry in the bottom of your McDonald's bag once you're finished eating. That is the best feeling you can have, but this is comparable. And Sayonara Wild Heart snuck its way into my eShop without me noticing, which is criminal as it reminds me so much of my beloved audio surf. Sayonara is so much more than its incredible custom written pop music and fast paced tracks. It's a fully fledged out gaming experience that plays out like an interactive music video for the hour long soundtrack this game boasts. The gameplay mixes it up from motorbike blasting, wall run and combat fight and enemy shooting and breaking hearts at 200 miles per hour. The visuals are a very aesthetically pleasing trip, and the cutscenes blend in so smoothly with the gameplay you'll be too scared to put down the controller for even a moment in case your character ends up blasting off without you realizing and running into a wall. Sayonara doesn't present much of a difficulty challenge. It's more of a musical experience you can play, but the fast-paced gameplay, constantly changing visuals, and fantastic music will keep you glued to the game from start to end. And all of this for just over 10 bucks? That's like the same price as an actual CD album. And you can't play this with a controller, nor would you actually want to play this at all. Candlebox, never even heard of it. <laughs> Next up, we have Freedom Finger. And it's not this one. It's the rude one. Ooh, I almost showed it. <laughs> hey, while we're talking about music, let's go from pop to rock, from Taylor Swift to Nickelback. Oh, those are terrible examples. I mean, who even likes Taylor Swift? Freedom Finger features 30 rock songs crammed into a soundtrack much like Tony Hawk. If nothing else, your time with Freedom Finger will probably add a few new bands into your Spotify rotation. But hopefully you'll also have a great time playing this humorously wacky shoot-em-up. And I honestly can't even remember the last time, if ever, a shoot-em-up game made it into one of these videos. I try and be diverse, but I, I just really don't like shoot-em-ups. <laughs> I, they've never appealed to me. I think that might be why I actually enjoyed the non-serious take on the genre here. It's not too difficult, and the gameplay really tries to shake it up. The best part about this game, and I mean the best part, is that for the first time in a game like this, you can actually reach out your chip, which just so happens to be a hand, and grab enemy ships. Then you can either throw them back at the bad guy's space windscreens, or use the friggin' ship as an alternative means of fire. You can also opt to just smash and bash the enemies you using your fist, or you can use your, of course, middle finger to blast away and really stick it to him. The over-the-top America attitude and humor was pretty ham-fisted at times, pun not intended, but you can't say the developers didn't give it their all creating a ridiculous shooter. I feel like not everyone will love this game, but if you're watching this and thinking, that, 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 that looks pretty good, 
No! Then I can pretty much guarantee that you're gonna love this one. Pikachu, I choose you! The Return of Obra Dinn was developed by the same guy who made the brilliant Papers, Please. A game that I have literally never even mentioned on this channel before, so if you exclusively only ever watch my content on this platform, you've probably never heard of or seen Papers, Please. Also, if you do only watch my content on this platform, there's something seriously wrong with you. Get help. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. Obra Dinn is the name of a ship that disappeared in the early 1800s. Then, four years later, it just rock and rolls back into port all on its own with the entire 60 crew on board all missing or dead as doornails. It's your job to figure out what the heck happened to each person on board the ship, and I do mean each person aboard the ship. Using a fancy stopwatch that rewinds time, you can see each crew member's last moments alive and piece together who or what killed them. And it's a game that actually makes you feel clever when you start piecing it all together. Figuring out who killed Bob Joe over there would be easy if you could see his death and hear him screaming, Oh my god, this fuzzy blue puppet is killing me with a sharpened Joy-Con! Probably figure out who that was. <laughs> Rather, you need to use subtle hints, clues, and various death scenes aboard this ship to jigsaw it all together like a good crossword puzzle. And it honestly does become as addicting as a good Sudoku puzzle. Now, and I'm surprised I made it this far without talking about the Game Boy-esque visual style. Honestly, these graphics are what caught my eye and made this game loudly stand out above the hordes of other indie games that get released every day. But it really, really works, not only in general, but for the older time period this game is set in. You should probably buy it. But if you're thinking it's probably not for you, it's probably not for you, and, and you probably shouldn't buy it. Some things in life just age well, like Keanu Reeves or The Mummy featuring Brendan Fraser. However, some things in life age terribly, like Milk or Brendan Fraser from The Mummy. I dare you to name any other video game that tricks you into thinking you're playing a blaster-focused first-person shooter, only to have you pick up a lightsaber halfway through the game and have it shift into a third-person hack-and-slash. No, nope, can't think of any? It, just Jedi Knight Academy 2? Oh, 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 oh. I loved this game as a 12 year old kid when it released. I can't tell you how excited I was for this game to come to the Switch so I could finally play it again and show the internet world what a great Star Wars game actually looks like. And when I finally downloaded it on my Switch after 17 years of waiting to play it again, I realized it's not good. It just hasn't aged well, sadly. It's not intuitive at all, the game has outdated mechanics left and right, and it refuses to teach you anything. If it wasn't for the fact that I can kind of remember what to do, I'd still be completely and utterly lost on the first level as we speak. But... I still had loads of fun replaying it. Especially in the last half of the adventure, throwing my lightsaber like a boomerang and reliving some of the best lightsaber duels of my childhood. But for newcomers, I, I would honestly avoid this one. <laughs> I mean, I personally, I've wasted $10 on much worse things. I mean, at some point, Kim bought a Candlebox album, so I mean, what? Are you talking to me about my Candlebox? Yeah, well, I told you to grab me the most ridiculous album you had and you got me this, so I assumed it was bad. Not bad? 10 out of 10. You know, I don't want to be mean or anything, because I really did like Cat Quest when it released on eShop whenever that was and I reviewed it. But there's something about this game, the name, the art style, that kind of just looks like a cheap budget mobile game. Oh, it is a, it is a mobile game. That's... Well, regardless, despite how it looks, the first Cat Quest was honestly a really great game, and now it has a sequel that's even better. To start with, they added two-player co-op into this cutesy action-adventure RPG, which is cool, and they also added a pup pup as a playable character. So really, they should have changed the name to Cat and Dog Quest, instead, which is somehow an even worse name. In Cat Quest, you have a pretty decently large open world to explore, filled with dungeons, exploration, quests, and it also has cute enemies to hack and slash all over. The combat is also decently fleshed out with sword slash and dodge roll and magic blast in, both active and passive spells, character customization, new weapons, and items scattered throughout the world. The game is so fast paced that it's just easy to get glued to the switch screen doing quest after quest. And for another low price of $10 game on the Switch, it's worth trying out. And I'm not kidding around. <laughs> I'm sorry, that joke was a catastrophe. <laughs> If you've watched these videos before, you'll know that I try and save the best one, or at least my favorite one, until the end. So the fact that we're still three games away from the end, and I'm talking about Ori now, 
says a lot about the quality of games in this video. It's extremely, yeah, interesting to me that arguably the best Xbox One exclusive game there was is now on Nintendo Switch, and yet it's just one of the many incredible games the Switch has in its library to offer. And it's in no way a jab at Ori at all. The game is perfect and I absolutely adore it. It's just a jab at Xbox's terrible video game library. Sorry. Not sorry. The first thing everyone is obligated to talk about when they review Ori is the visuals, which are absolutely stunning. Honestly, the game is so breathtaking to stare at it. It's difficult to even put into words the reaction my senses feel watching the soft lights bounce off the mesmerizing environments. Coupled with the rich atmosphere and the beautiful music, the world just feels real, feels alive. It, it feels feely, which makes the prologue of this game that much more heartbreaking. Honestly, Ori is such a sweet little character, it's so hard for me not to imprint this little guy's personality onto him and fall in love with him for that reason. The controls are so well designed, and the exploration, the platforming, the combat is just such a smooth delight to play. Ori's strong storytelling will keep you invested if nothing else, especially with its surprising plot twists. The world's light has been diminished, and you as Guardian have been stripped of your powers and your loved ones, and now it's your job to restore light in the world and have a wonderful time doing so. It is a must play of our generation. Chief you! Chief you! Overland. Aesthetically, Overland had me hooked from the moment I laid my peepers on those small squares of land floating suspended in empty space, and then the squares themselves filled with minimalistic design characters, animals, buildings, cars, and invading aliens. Or creatures. It's not clear, doesn't really matter. Touch them and they kill you. They want to demolish you and they erupt from the ground as soon as they hear any kind of noise whatsoever. It plays as a strategy game and it's absolutely brutal and unforgiving. Maybe even too much so, unless you really crave a challenge. You start with two characters. If you're lucky, one might be a good boy, a little pup pup. And your plan is to road trip across the United States to escape Whatever the heck that thing is. Unlike most strategy games of this nature, you should probably just avoid combat at all costs. Every single step you make counts, and one wrong move could be the end of your entire playthrough, and I'm not over-exaggerating. And it doesn't help that you have extremely low inventory space. If you have a vehicle, you can throw a couple things onto it, but on your person, you'll be lucky to find a character that can hold more than one item. And if you find much-needed gas, you better hope that whatever you are carrying, you can afford to drop it and probably lose it. It's frustrating, and honestly, I find it unrealistically challenging, but that does make successful runs through the game that much more thrilling, so it's a catch-22. If you're wounded and you can't heal, you're doomed. If your car explodes or you run out of gas, you're doomed. If you misclick and make a mistake, yeah, but there's just something about this game that makes me want to keep trying and playing. And that something is probably the fact that it's a good game. Also, side note, that won't make it into the video, but for some reason I keep thinking about it. When I went to the DMV to get my license, I took my Switch and I was playing Overland the entire time, which was like three hours. Screw the DMV. I can't figure out if I like Knight's Quest or love Knight's Quest. Some of you are probably as sick of hearing the word Zelda clone as you are seeing Zelda clones. And I don't think just simply calling a Knight's Quest a Zelda clone does it any kind of justice, as it has loads of its own spunk and personality. But I mean, ultimately, it's what it is. It's a Zelda clone. It almost feels like a parody of games like Zelda or platformers like 3D Mario games. It has a large open world filled with dungeons, towns, hilarious characters, and various locations to explore. And well, it, honestly, it looks pretty dang gorgeous as well. Much like Breath of the Wild, you're able to go anywhere you want right from the start of the game. But unlike Breath of the Wild, that climbing involves a lot less of just grabbing all over stuff and going straight up until you run out of breath and end up falling back down again. But rather in a Knight's Quest, it's a lot more platforming jumping. The combat is very Wind Waker-like in style. It's not amazing, but it gets the job done. And rather than finding items to complete puzzles and dungeons and throughout the world, you gain spells you can use instead. A knight's quest? seriously impressed me. Initially, I was worried about the $25 price tag, but the time I spent exploring this brand new world and completing its dungeons alone was well than worth the price. Remember when everyone was ooing and ahhing over slain back from hell or back to hell or whatever it was on Nintendo Switch? I do. 
I remember. Well, this is their new game, Valferis, a game heavily inspired by heavy metal and so hardcore that Nintendo's website has you confirm your age before you can even read about this game. Yeah, that's freaking rock and roll, man. Valferis is a run and gun game, which doesn't only diversify this video game list genre is even more so, but much like shoot 'em ups, I rarely get a chance to gush over a good run and gun game. And the visuals are a psychedelic mess. Your blaster blows out shots so massive they shake the entire screen and explode your enemies into a gory mess on impact. Your sword is so brutal it will smash apart anything in its wake and you are so brutal that your character will even have flip head bang over the subscribe button every single time he gets an upgrade. There's also massive shotguns, battle axes, and more along the path to gory glory. But if I could take a rock and roll chill pill for a second, of all the games on this list, Valferis probably has the hardest asking price at $25. So that's how it's a bit steep. But I can tell you it's a polished quality game worth the price if you do decide to pull out that wallet and just freaking make it rain on this quality game. The level designs are well thought out and stay fresh throughout the entire game. And hey, guess what? The music is fucking freaking roll. Listen to this. <laughs> Hey mom, look what I can do. Lucy Goosey, for some reason a tiny game about an even smaller goose took the world by storm and captured the hearts of everyone. I don't think there's a soul in the gaming world that hasn't at least heard of Untitled Goose Game. Which just goes to show that no matter how simple, strange, or obscure a concept may be, if you take the time to make a fantastically fun video game, people will be drawn to it. At this point, you not only know more than enough about this game, but also that it's obviously worth buying, but for some reason, some people like to just hear me talk about video games they like and at least acknowledge their existence. So let's, let's do it. You are a silly goose that can honk, duck, flap, and most affectionately hold things in its beak. Or more accurately, steal things with its beak, hide them, and or taunt the humans with them, and, and that, that, that is the entire game. Screwing with people, annoying the heck out of them, and watching them try to deal with a goose that just won't leave them alone. It's such wholesome, hilarious fun. I honestly couldn't tell you how many 30 second clips I grabbed of this game using the Switch's capture button to then go and show Kim later, and both of us would be laughing at this stupid little goose. I think this might be the one actually where he goes to sit down. <laughs> it's just so stupid, because it looks like it's what a goose would do. The game not only manages to capture Nintendo's own inherent innocence in their games, but also it's just the perfect game to pick up and knock out a few to-do tasks and then put back down for later. Or, and this is actually my only complaint, finish it in one sitting, because it's only about a two hour game, unfortunately. It does have quite a bit of replay value to be fair, but two hours, it just left me wanting more. I can't fathom it, but I just love that this tiny two hour adventure about a tiny goose <laughs> ended up becoming a solid reason to own a Nintendo Switch. There's another 10 games, uh, totaling 180, can you freaking believe it? Just like Val Faris, make sure you head bang, hair flip all over that subscribe button, smash like on this video because they take so much effort to make. If you want to keep seeing them, you have to keep liking them. You want to buy a little little t-shirt? A little, like this little retro Zelda t-shirt? Look at this thing. Look how cool it is. You obviously sweaties because it's the sweater time of year. Why not? I really do hope you had fun here today.